I don't know if you're familiar with dad jokes or not, but I love dad jokes. If you don't know what a dad joke is, it's basically a kind of a corny little phrase and a little question, that kind of turn of words, as it were. And I have a friend of mine who we love dad jokes, and we'll text each other back and forth. And so um, I want to share a couple of these with you so you can kind of get the feel for that if you don't know what dad jokes are. So I don't know if you heard about there was two spiders who got engaged. Yeah, they met on the web. <laughs> Oh, they get worse. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear about the two cell phones who got married? Yeah, the ceremony wasn't that great, but the reception was terrific. <laughs> Some of you will get that later at lunchtime. Oh, because their cell phones reception. Okay, I get it now, right? You have to explain it. It's not funny. <laughs> but here's the last one, I promise. Marriage is when a man and a woman, when the, two, the man and the woman become one. The trouble starts when they try to decide which one they want to become. <laughs> To which the wives say, what's the conversation? We should all that <laughs> If you're a guest or you're joining us online today, we want to welcome you to our brand new series called The Bride. And we actually started this series last week when we talked about Easter and the, the awesome day of Easter. It's the resurrection of Jesus. And I made the statement how whether you believe the resurrection of Jesus happened or whether you don't believe it happened or not, the fact is it changed everything. It changed everything about our lives and changed everything about humanity. And I promised to as you last week, if you were here, that we would kind of unpack what that means. So I'm glad you came back. Welcome for that. If you're a guest here, I'd encourage you to go back and watch that. But just to kind of set this up for you, what we're doing in this series, there's really four significant events that happen in human history and God's word. And the first one happened with the creation of the world. We believe that God created everything in perfection and unity and harmony, all the stars in the sky, all the fish in the sea. And then he created man and woman. And man and woman were the culmination of God's creation. They were created in the image of God to have a relationship with God and to care for his creation. Which brings us to the second event in human history, was what we consider called the fall. That's where man and woman decided, you know what, I know God, you gave us this, I know you gave us this direction, but I think we probably know better than you, God. We're going to try to do it our own way. Now, I have no biblical evidence of this, but I'm pretty sure that Adam and Eve were about 14 years old when this happened, okay? Any parents of teenagers can relate to this, okay? There's something about us, isn't there? When you get to that age, we just think, ah, I don't know, I think we could do it ourselves. And the fall of man happened. And all of that perfection was corrupted by this decision to go against what God had set up. And that's created a period of time. Sometimes we call it the Old Testament. Sometimes we call it the Old Covenant. Here's the point of it. At that moment, the immediately when man went their own way, God began a plan of redemption for all of mankind to be restored to that perfection that God created. And God raised up a family that became a nation that became Israel, that said it is a physical kingdom that represents what's the redemption of God's plan for all of mankind. It was never intended just for one certain people group in one certain place. That's where God used to bless the entire world. And the entire culmination of this entire season of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament it was the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus was specifically born in that place, in that time, in that way, to show mankind how to be delivered. Because the whole time before that, we tried to get it right and we couldn't get it. But Jesus came along and showed us. Which brings us to the third event in human history. So we have creation, we have the fall, and then we have the event we celebrated last week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the moment that Jesus rose from the dead, the moment the resurrection happened, something significant happened in human history. Everything changed. The curse of sin was broken. Death and destruction was overcome, and Jesus created the new way that we exist in today. And then something very interesting happened. Jesus went away. He went back to heaven. He left his followers, which brings us to the fourth event in human history that is yet to come. And that is the second coming of Jesus. And that is the moment. And what is that place? What is that event called? And I know many people talk about the second coming of Jesus and what that's going to look like, what that's going to mean. I, I read things and I see things on the internet all the time about people hearing about Jesus coming back. And, and I just think that's interesting because Jesus said, I don't even know when I'm coming back. So if you hear somebody say they know when Jesus is coming back, you can just tune them right out, all right, because they're a moron. I'm just going to say that, okay? But that's the moment we're talking about. And it's described in the book of Revelation. And I want to go ahead and read Revelation 9, 19, 7. Sorry, it's going to be on the screen behind me. I want us to read how that moment is described. Let's read this out loud together. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. The Lamb they're talking about is Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was slain. And the bride in that verse is you. It's me. 
It's the church. That's how God described it. And so this fourth event I'm calling the wedding. There's creation, there's the fall, there's the resurrection, and then there's the wedding of Jesus and his church. We are living in the time right now between the resurrection and the wedding. I mentioned this before, the the theological term is the already but not yet. So the question we're going to ask throughout this series is, how are we to live? In this time between the resurrection and the wedding, how are we to live? And it's very simple. We are to live as a bride preparing for her wedding. That is what Jesus described. That is how John described it. That is how the church is to function. And I want you to think about that for a second. Some of you maybe have been a bride. Maybe you've known a bride or maybe your daughters have been brides before. What does a bride do when it comes to her wedding? Better question, what does a bride not do when it comes to her wedding, okay? Let's just play with me for a second. Does she wake up the day of her wedding and say, geez, I wonder what I'm going to wear today? (laughs) There's a lot of time, effort, and can we just say money that's spent into her dress. And then there's the bridesmaid's dress. And then there's the groom's dress. You following with me? Does a bride give a lot of attention to who's going to be at the wedding? You better believe it, right? That's why we get those invitations. That's why we get those RSVPs, why you need to eat, right? Does a bride give a lot of attention to what the wedding is actually going to look like? Where's it going to be at? What are the decorations? What are the flowers? You with me on this? See, we are, as the bride of Jesus Christ, to live in anticipation for the return of Jesus Christ. And what is that day going to look like? But here's the problem. And I see it all the time when it comes to weddings, and you probably do too. Brides will spend a lot of times preparing for their wedding. I wonder how much time they spent preparing for the marriage. And I say this to every couple who comes to me and says, Pastor, we want to marry you. I say, listen, I love weddings. I think they're great. I care more about your marriage than I do your wedding. Because there's a lot of time, effort, and money put into weddings. If we took that and instead put it into the marriage, I think the divorce rate in this country would be a little different. Because here's the sad truth. Here's the sad reality. Even if people who are followers of Jesus Christ, the divorce rate is still about the same as it is with people who are not. I think there's something broken on that. And that brings us to this series because I don't think we understand what it means to be the bride of Jesus Christ. And when it comes to the church, and I'm going to say this, I've been in the church my entire life. I think there's probably too much emphasis given to the wedding and we forget about the marriage. Let me explain what I'm saying when I say that. There's a lot of time, effort, and energy given to the moment of the second coming of Christ. When is Jesus going to come back? How are we going to be? Are you saved? And I think all those things are important, but I don't want to neglect the marriage. Because we're going to be living with Jesus forever in eternity. Church, what is that going to look like? How are we going to act? How are we going to behave? And that is the whole point of this time in between the resurrection and the wedding. How are we to become more like Jesus? How are we to live that way? And I'm just going to throw out kind of a silly example here. If you were a bride preparing for your wedding, would you think, man, I better go out and have sex with as many guys as I possibly can because as soon as I'm married, I can't have sex with guys anymore. That would be wrong thinking, wouldn't it? Let me ask you this. If we're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ as God's bride, how should we be living now? I'm not talking about your salvation. Jesus took care of that on the cross. How are we to become more like Christ? And that's the point of this series, what we're going to be talking about. As the bride of Jesus Christ, as his church, how are we to behave now in preparation for when Jesus comes back and the marriage that's going to happen? So to kick us off today, I'm going to talk about a word that I don't like. And I guarantee you, you don't like this word either. This is the word, the word sin. Ooh, now even as I say that, people are like, I'm better get up and leave. The pastor's going to talk about sin today, all right? It happens, right? Sin is a word we don't like to talk about. But if you've been here and you've been part of Celebrate, you've heard me say this before. I believe Yankton, South Dakota is one of the best places on planet Earth to talk about sin. And probably not for the reasons you're all thinking about right now, okay? Did you know that in good old Yankton, South Dakota, we have the world's largest Indoor archery complex right here in Yankton, South Dakota. How many of you knew that before? Okay, now some of you know that's actually where we launched our church at, was in the archery center. That's where we first started at. And so that is right here in Yankton, South Dakota. Now what does that have to do with sin, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked. And to help us out, to kind of reinforce this, our friends at the NFA Eastern Archery Center actually gave us a gift that we can use today to help you guys understand what archery has to do with sin. And so I'm going to reveal this here for you guys. This right here, oh, it's going to roll up on me. That's all right. This right here is what's called a target. 
Okay, so if you're not familiar with archery, what happens is you put this up and you try to shoot it. Then this little thing right here in the center, everybody know what that's called? The bullseye. So this is how it works. You take a bow and arrow and you try to shoot at this target and you try to aim at the? Okay, what happens if you miss the bullseye? Okay, anybody know what the word's called when you miss the bullseye? Sin. Sin is an old English word that starts about archery that says if you shoot at the target and you miss the bullseye, it's called a sin. Say it with me, church. What's it called? Sin. You're aiming at the target and you miss the bullseye. It's called? Sin. See where my red dot is? Is that a sin right there? Is that a sin? How about that? How about that? How about that? Some of you are like up here, right? <laughs> you with me on this? That is what sin means. Sin simply means there's a bullseye. And our goal is to try to hit that bullseye. And if you miss it, that's sin. Here's our problem. We like to rank our sins, don't we? We like to say, well, this sin isn't as bad as this sin. Definitely not as bad as that sin. That's not the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, sin is sin. And let me bring it back to Jesus just to help reinforce this pack. Jesus is the bullseye. Jesus came and showed us how to live in that bullseye. And that's why we say, listen, what we want to aim for. As a church, we say we want people to do what? We want people to meet Jesus, and then we want to what? Be like Jesus. We're trying to hit the bullseye. Are we going to get it right every time? As soon as you do, I'm going to put the microphone down. You can come up here and preach, okay? Because I'm still working on this too. Are you with me on this? This is what we need to talk about. So I want to give you, and there's really three things about sin we need to understand before we move on. And so I'm, if you want, might want to write these down. Here's the first one. Sin is also our nature. Okay, so when it comes to talking about sin, sin is our nature. What I mean by that is from the moment that Adam and Eve stepped away from the Garden of Eden and they were in rebellion of God, our creation has been broken. I mentioned that before. We are corruptible people living in this sin. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ, hear this, didn't necessarily take that away because we're still born into sin. We have an opportunity to be redeemed by that, but perfection was corrupted. Let me put it in terms of our bullseye here. Is it easier to hit the target or to miss the target? Yeah, it's easier to miss it. That's our sin nature. We have to really work at it to get to the center. You see with me? That's what sin nature means. Now, some people might struggle with this idea because there's a, a lie in culture that believes everybody's a good person. And sometimes I hear that, right? That people say, oh, he's such a good person. Every look right here, there's no good person. There was one, it was Jesus, and we crucified him, okay? And if you struggle with that, I always, the analogy I always use is, have you ever met a child, <laughs> okay? All right, they're beautiful, they're little creations, and they're little wicked people, aren't they, all right? And if you don't believe that, come spend some time with them, kids, and you realize that. I think that's why God made kids so cute, all right? Because we put one put up with that from somebody else. We are our sin nature. If you put a little child in a room, okay, and then you put one red button on the wall, and you look at that child and you say, don't push that button. What's the first thing I'm going to do? I run over and push the button. What is that about us? Why do we have that? And I would contend that's our sin nature. That's that corruptible perfection that we have as a result of sin. But here's the second word that I want you to write down. And this is my word. The word is action. Now, the fancy theological word for that is the word transgression. Simply, all that means is we miss the target. There's a bullseye. There's a target. And we shoot and we miss the target. And sometimes it's because we're not even aware of the target, right? Some of you, before you became a believer of Jesus, you didn't even realize there was a target we were aiming at. Okay, it's still sin. That's a transgression. Some of us try really hard to hit the target and we still miss. Because again, the standard of Jesus is perfection. And even if you hit the bullseye, and some of you are pretty good at hitting the bullseye every so often, but it takes a lot of effort and time. That's what that means. That's the act of sin as, as transgression or action. But there's a third one that I want to talk about, and this is the word, I'm going to use the word rebellion. And the fancy theological term is the word iniquity, but we don't say the word iniquity. We say the word rebellion, right? Rebellion basically says, listen, I know there's a target. I'm aware of it, and I don't care. I'm going to shoot wherever I want to shoot. Or even worse, what happens in culture today is, I'm just going to make my own target over here. God, I don't like your target. I don't like what you set up. I don't, I don't trust that. I'm going to go make my own target, and I'm going to shoot over here, God. That's an act of rebellion against God. And that's not what we should be doing. And if you're here today and you still struggle with that idea, and, and I want to say this too, that welcome home. 
We're glad that you're here. If we're a church that exists for people who are far from God, who maybe don't like church that much, but here's what I want to agree with. Here's something I think we can build on and agree with together. Every single person, whether you agree with this idea of sin or not, every single person you will meet is a sin identification expert. Here, let me explain that to you. We're really good at seeing sin in other people. Ever been on social media lately, okay? Ever heard of cancel culture? That's the whole point. What you're doing is wrong, and we're going to crucify you because we can see it really clearly in other people. Let me give you an example. If you were to find out today that I was having an affair on a lane, you would say, boy, you're a sleazebag, and you'd be right because I would be a sleazebag. You don't need the Bible to tell you that, do you? You just know it in your heart. Even if you disagree with it, you understand that. Why? Because sin is wrong, and we're really good at identifying it in other people. Let me soften the example up for you. Anybody ever been in traffic lately? <laughs> Any ever been at the corner of 21st and Douglas at the four-way stop sign, right? We are sin identification experts. Why don't you just turn? Why don't you just go? But as soon as it's us doing that, oh, <laughs> it's a little harder to swallow. See, we can easily identify sin in other people. But if we're being honest, it's hard to see in the mirror, isn't it? When we're looking at ourselves, it's hard to see. And this, I would contend, is the major problem in the church today. We are really good at pointing out other people's sins, but we'll do a really bad job of looking in the mirror and saying, what have I done to Jesus? How have I missed the mark? See, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be the bride of Jesus Christ, is when I say, I am more broken over my sin than I am looking at yours. I don't need to amplify your sin. The measure I'm going to stand myself against is against Jesus Christ and every time I fail. I don't need to point it out in other people. So in your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love, love, love to get you a Bible. It's God's Word. If you don't have one, you can download YouVersion. It's a free app available on any smartphone or device right now. As you're turning to Joshua, if you're part of Celebrate, you would be very familiar with Joshua. Because we just finished our series, Jordan River Rules, two weeks ago. And we wrapped it up, and if you weren't here or um, new, you can go to our website or podcast, listen to that um, series, such a great series we've been through. But the reason why we're talking about today is because there was a situation that happened right at the end of where we left off the series. So if you remember in the series, we left it off as the children of Israel were marching towards Jericho, the first city in the promised land. And God had promised to the nation of Israel, I'm going to give you this city. In fact, you won't even have to fight for it. All you have to do is walk around it, blow your trumpets, the walls are going to fall down, and the city is going to be yours. But here's the deal. And this is where our bullseye comes in. This is where God gives the nation of Israel the bullseye. He said, listen, Jericho is yours. I'm going to give it to you. Here's the bullseye. Nothing in the city is to be taken. The city is to be completely destroyed. We're not going to rebuild it. You're not going to take any of the animals. You're not going to take any of the plunder. All of it belongs to me. And the reason why God did that is very important. Don't miss it, church. He said, listen, I'm going to give you the promised land. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be rich. But this first one is mine. This first one belongs to me. You are to dedicate everything in Jericho to me, and everything else is yours. Sound familiar, church? <laughs> Where God teaches us the first one belongs to me, the rest of the nine belong to you. It's exactly what God is teaching the nation of Israel. But there was a guy who was part of the nation of Israel, a guy named Achan. And Achan, because of Jericho, would become very famous, but not for the reasons Achan wanted to become famous. So in Joshua chapter 7, I'm going to read in the first verse. But the Israelites were unfaithful regarded to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zermi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now, there's two things I want you to take out of this verse. And if you've been part of Celebrate, you heard me say this all the time. When you come to names in the Bible you don't know how to pronounce, just say them with authority. No one else knows how to say them anyway, okay? But here's the second thing. Why would God list Achan's dad, his grandpa, his great-grandpa, his tribe, and the entire nation? Isn't that strange? Only Achan took those things. Why would God take the time to do that? And this is something you need to understand when it comes to sin. Sin never exists in isolation. I'm going to say that one more time. Sin never exists in isolation, and we're about to find out why that's such a big deal. 
The consequences of us missing the mark that God had pointed to us never just simply affect us. They ripple out to the people around us as well. Church, sin is a big deal to God. This is why God is so clear about what the target is, what we're aiming for. God has said, listen, the first one is mine. The rest are yours. Leave it. And here's what would happen. The next city was the city called Ai. Joshua thought, well, Ai is not a very big town. I'm just going to summarize. I'm just going to take a few people. We're going to send them to Ai. It won't be a problem. They'll come back. No big deal. Don't need to bother the whole army. But here's what happened. When they went to take Ai, they were completely destroyed, and they were routed by the city of Ai, which is not what they thought was going to happen. They got completely creamed, and the soldiers came back, and Joshua was distraught. If you go down to verse 6, then Joshua tore his clothes and fell down, face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. The very first response was to go to God. Seek God. See, when the battle belongs to the Lord, defeat is always because of a reason that we're doing. And we need to find, seek God and find out why that is. Look at what verse 10 says. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. Go to verse 12. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. Now, I don't know about you, but if you read that, you're like, well, wait a minute. Israel didn't sin. Achan sinned. Achan was the only one to take the stuff. And as far as we could tell, at no point in Scripture does it say Achan even told anybody what he did. He was the only one who knew about it. He kept it hidden. No one else knew about it. Why is the whole nation suffering because of that? Because I'm going to say it one more time, church. Sin never exists in isolation. The consequences of our sin can ripple through all our relationships. So what did Joshua do? For this situation, God told Joshua, the very next morning, have all the people stand up. The whole nation stand before him. And one by one, they came up. And they would call, cast by lots the tribe. And the tribe of, of Achan's was, the tribe of Judah was taken. And then they had the tribes come forward by clan by clan until his clan was taken. And then the clans, they brought family by family to come up. And from the families, they had each man in the family come up until it landed on Achan. Church, can you put yourself in that situation? When you're standing there going, what's going on here? How is this happening? And all of a sudden, oh, it's my tribe. Oh, it's my clan. Oh, it's my family. Oh, is it me? Why would God do that? And here's why I think it's true. And it's important to understand this. I think God wanted Achan to have an opportunity to come clean. God was giving Achan an opportunity to say, listen, it's my fault. I screwed up. Because sin never exists in isolation. But I'm going to say the second thing about sin you need to understand. Every single sin will be exposed. There is nothing that is hidden from the sight of God. God will expose every single sin. And before you push back on that, I'm going to contend we like justice, don't we? If somebody does something wrong to me, boy, I want justice for that. So we like that idea about God, that God is a God of justice. Nobody's ever going to get away with anything, and we like that except for when it's us <laughs> and for our sin. Because God is a just God. And Achan was exposed before the entire nation for what he had done. And don't miss this, church. This is so important. Achan was not sorry for his sin. Achan was sorry that he got caught. I'm going to say that one more time because I think we missed that. Achan was not sorry that he had sinned against God. Achan was sorry that he got caught. And we see this all the time, don't we? You know, I'm a big baseball fan. And Major League Baseball, if you don't know, had a big scandal about 20 years ago with performance-enhancing drugs. And there wasn't any testing, so all these guys were juicing, and they were hitting, like, monster home runs, and it was crazy and stuff. And then they started doing testing. <laughs> and they find out that these guys weren't clean, and they were actually cheating to get this. And when a, a, many of these athletes would come out with a positive test, and they'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. You're not sorry you took the drugs. You're sorry you got caught. If you were really sorry, you would have stopped taking the drugs, right? You would have got clean, and then you would have done it legit me, but you weren't because you were sorry that you got caught. We see this all the time in politics, don't we? We see politicians that get caught with their hand in the kitty jar. I'm really sorry that I got caught. You're not sorry for the action. And unfortunately, can, can I just say this? As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his church, it happens in the church too, doesn't it? If we went around this room, I guarantee you, you could name a ministry leader, somebody high up in the church that has been caught doing something they shouldn't be doing. And you think in your head, if you're really sorry about it, 
you're not sorry for what you've done. You're sorry you got caught. Because if you're really sorry about it, you would have confessed it and stopped doing it. And that's the same thing that happened with Achan. Can I just say it again, church? Sin is a big deal to God. Sin never exists in isolation, and every single sin will be exposed. Now I want to give you the good news. You ready for this? Okay. Achan does something after he is exposed, of course, after it's brought to light that he is the guilty party. Achan says something that I think is so important that we don't want to miss, because I think this is the key to staying out of sin. All of us would agree we want that to stay out of We want to try to hit that mark. How do we avoid it? Look at what Achan says in Joshua 7, verse 21. When I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Now, I'm going to walk you through that verse because if you, didn't, if you missed it, sin is a progression. And I want you to write these down. Here's the four progressions of sin. The first one is, I saw Achan said, I saw the robe, I saw the gold, I saw the silver. Can I say it this way, church? Sin always starts with a view. It's either something we see physically or it's an idea that we see in our mind. Now, it's very important you understand this. Seeing does not necessarily mean sinning. I'm going to say that one more time. Just because you see something doesn't necessarily mean it's going to turn into a sin. For example... When Jesus was tempted by the enemy, what did the enemy do? He would show Jesus things. The enemy showed Jesus the rocks, and he said, hey, you know, you could turn these rocks into bread. That wasn't sin. You just saw it. You with me? The enemy showed Jesus all the kingdoms. He said, hey, all these could be yours if you bow down and worship me. That wasn't sin. Jesus saw it. But here's the difference between what Jesus did and what you and I sometimes do. Jesus didn't allow what he saw to go into sin. He stopped right with the seeing it. See, here's the thing. We need to stop sometimes what we're looking at because it can lead us to sin. I love the quote that Martin Luther says. He said, I cannot stop the birds from flying above my head, but I can prevent them from making a nest in my hair. See the difference between that, church? We can't stop what we see sometimes, but we can definitely stop it from becoming sin. Achan didn't do that. Achan saw all the plunder, and he said, I'm not going to stop at seeing. He went to the next step, which is I wanted. He started with I saw, and then he went to I wanted. Achan said, I saw the stuff, and I wanted them. Desire is the birthplace of sin. This is why envy is such a big deal, right? We think about it. We like, man, I wish I could have that. Boy, I wish I would have done that. Why can they have this, and why can I not have that? And we start to think about it. We start to fantasize about it. What would it be like if I took that? What would it be like if that was actually mine? And that's where we come to that word that Achan said, the word covet. Coveting is a sin. I'm going to say that again, church. Coveting is a sin. It's one of God's top ten. It was one of his top ten lists. To covet is basically to tell God, God, what you've given me is not enough. See, I deserve more. Achan knew very well God had said, listen, this is the target. This is the bullseye. Everything in this city is mine. Don't touch it. And Achan saw it, and he wanted it. And he started down that path of saying, man, wouldn't it be nice if I could have it? What leads us to the third part. I saw, I wanted. Here's number three. I took. Achan saw that. He started playing with it as mine, and then he took it. The sin moved from a thought to a desire to an action. And I'm going to say it again. He knew it was wrong, and so do we. I've said this before. I don't need to sit up here and preach to you what's right and wrong. I think you already know. You never have to teach a child, hey, honey, come over here. I want to show you how to lie. Okay? We just know how to do that, don't we, right? I don't have to tell you that stealing is wrong. I always love that when people say, I don't believe in absolute truth. You've heard me say this before. Somebody comes to you and says, I don't believe in absolute truth. Just steal their wallet, okay? Because all of a sudden, now they start believing in absolute truth. Why should we do it? That's what it means to take. We have the desire, thought to desire to action. He knew it was wrong, and he did it anyways. But what do we do when we take stuff? We start to justify it. I deserve this. We start to minimize it. It's no big deal. It's only a little white lie. 
We start to blame other people. Well, if they hadn't done that or if they would have done that, see? And then we take and we take and we take and we take. And that desire, has, uh, that thought has moved to desire, which has now moved to an action with always, always, and don't miss this, church. It's so important. Always, always leads to number four. I hid. I hid. Achan says, after I saw them, I wanted them, I took them, and I hid them under my tent. And this is the enemy's biggest, oldest trick in the book. And I'm going to show you what it is so you don't have to fall for it anymore. But I guarantee you, you've done this in your life. We just got done saying, we justify, we minimize, and we blame. It's no big deal. I deserve this. It's okay. I'll do it just this once. And immediately after you happen, what does the enemy come in your mind and go, boy, shouldn't have done that. Better keep that covered up. Hope nobody finds out about that. I don't know why Satan's Southern all of a sudden, but anyway. <laughs> That's what we think, though, don't we? In our minds, we start thinking about it. We want to hide it immediately after that happens. And that's exactly what happened to Achan. Achan was justified in the moment, and he took it and he hid it because he didn't want anybody to find out what happened. And there are two words in our culture today that I think sometimes are getting a bad rap, but I think they could... Uh, do better with that. Here's what I'm saying. These two words are shame and guilt. Shame and guilt are not necessarily bad emotions. Here's what I mean by that. God has given us the gift of shame and guilt. The problem is it's been corrupted by sin. And so much time, shame and guilt comes and it becomes who you are instead of what you've done. Do you see the difference between those two things? And I think a healthy shame and guilt to say, listen, I have a relationship with you. I don't want to damage our relationship. Therefore, why would I want to do that? I'll give you an example. The reason why I don't fool around on a lane has nothing to do with the Bible. The reason why I don't fool around with, on a lane has nothing to do with me being a pastor. Why would I want to hurt her like that? Why would I want to do anything to hurt my wife? That's what keeps me from that, that relationship. See, if you feel the need to hide something, you really need to push in on why are you doing it. And I've done this before. I said, listen, if we had a, a, a picture here, video of all of your sins for the last week, and we're going to play them on the screen behind you, how many of you would feel uncomfortable about that? Okay? And if there is, if there's something on that from the last week that you would feel uncomfortable playing on that screen, you really need to push into that. Why do you feel the need to hide that? We are to, called by God to be children of light. Look at what Jesus said, the words of Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 20. Everyone who does evil hates light. And will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by truth and comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been right in the sight of God. Church, sin is a big deal to God. Sin never exists in isolation. And every single sin will one day be exposed just like it was for Achan. So to help you out with this, I want to give you these things. So each one of those things, I saw, I wanted, I took, I hid. I hope you wrote those down. I saw, I wanted, I took, I hid. Every single one of these steps, this progression that every sin follows throughout human history, I'm going to give you another word to put with it. So when it comes to our, what we see, change your view. If you want to avoid going down a path of sin, starting with what I saw, change your view. I said it before, sin always starts with a view. Sometimes it's just as simple as looking the other way. Remember the song we used to sing when we were little kids, at least I did in church? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Watch what you see and look away. And Jesus gave an extreme example of this in Matthew chapter 5. Look at what Jesus said. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, you might say, Pastor, that's a pretty extreme example. Let me give you an example of modern day, for example. If Jesus were here today and he would say, if your iPhone, whoa, if your iPhone causes you to sin, throw it away. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? What? I, I can go through life without a smartphone, Jesus? It's better to go through life without a smartphone than to be eternally separated from God. What are you looking at? Change your view. Change your view. Here's the second one. If When it comes to the I saw, I wanted, when it comes to I wanted, change my thinking. Those desires that come from what we see, if you're struggling with that, change how you are thinking. Look at what Paul says in Romans 12. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Okay, Paul, what's the pattern of this world? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Can I give you one thing to change your thinking? Be thankful for what you have. Look around at all the things that God has given you and stop looking at the things you don't have or you wish you had. Be thankful for what you have. Change your thinking. It is a big deal. Sin is a big deal. A lie is a lie. No matter how big or how small you call it, a lie is still a lie. A sin is still a sin, no matter what happens. Think about what would happen if that would happen. Go down that road and say, listen, in my mind, what would happen if I do this? And sometimes that can prevent it, right? If I were to do this thing and I would go down this road, this is what would happen. And then this would happen. See, that's what the enemy doesn't show you. He doesn't show you the result of your sin. If I go down this road and I think this way and I act this way, what would the result of that be? Who would I hurt? What are the ripple effects? If we truly took the time to think about that, it would change everything about that. Here's it is. Stop sinning. I saw, I wanted, I took, I hid. When it comes to I hid, change your direction. You are always heading in the way that you think of your last position. And you need to change the way that you're thinking. And you need to change where your position is. That's what we need to change. And I'm going to unpack this more next week. So um, we'll talk about it more next week. But I want to show you this first verse. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all our sins. How are we, as the church of Jesus Christ, called to live in the time between the resurrection and the wedding. This is how we're going to see it. Sin is a big deal to God. We have a target, and that's Jesus. That's who Jesus has given us. He's given us a target. Our sin never exists in isolation. God loves us too much to keep us in our sin. Our sin has ripple effects that go out through generations, and it affects people around us, and we need to stop doing that. Every single sin will be exposed, church. One day we're all going to stand before God and we're going to be exposed. Again, Achan wasn't sorry that he had sinned. He was sorry that he got caught. It's going to come up. Now, I'm going to break one of the rules that we should have here. And so here's the thing. Um, When it comes to church and when it comes to sermons, we're always taught we want to give people a soft landing. This is what I mean by that. We want you to come. We want you to feel good. We want you to feel hopeful. We kind of want to leave you with something hopeful. And as I was preparing this message, God was very clear with me. He says, don't do that this week. And and let me explain what I'm talking about. If you're here today and you're a guest, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, welcome. We're so glad you're here. I need to talk to our celebrators for just a minute. If you're here and you're part of Celebrate Church, if you say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to let this hit you just kind of hard today. And here's what I want to say is, is there something in your life right now that you need to bring up? Is there something that's hidden? Maybe there's something that you've been looking at that you need to stop looking at, right? Maybe there's something that you need to stop desiring to have. Maybe there's a desire that you have. You need to stop. Maybe there's something you've taken. Maybe there is an active sin that you've been a part of that you just need to say, hey, I need to quit doing this. And if you don't know what those three are, is there anything in your life that's hidden right now that you would feel ashamed if it became exposed? And I'm telling you, this is not, nothing to do with your salvation. Please don't hear that. Okay? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to heaven. I understand that. We're not talking about the wedding. We're talking about the marriage. You with me on this? How are we to become like Christ? We are to do that now. We are to exist in the now to prepare for the yet to come. We're not going to be the bride that's going to say, how many guys can I go out and sleep with before I get married? We're going to be the bride that says, how can I become more like my husband? And when that marriage comes forever, we can be that. Do you understand that, church? Do you see how if we are a church that gets that, that understands that, we're going to attract people who want to see that? Because that's unique in our world, isn't it? You know what's not unique? Judgmental, finger pointing, blaming, minimizing, justifying. None of that should happen in God's church. Are we that place where we can people come and we can say, listen, I'm, I'm okay not being okay. And so how we're going to do that, and I'm going to walk you through this, what this is going to look like. I'm going to pray, but we're going to do something a little bit different today. After I get done praying, we're going to sing a song. As the song is playing, if you are here today and you feel like there's something in your life that you really need to take care of, 
I'd like to invite you to come up forward and stand at the cross. If you need to sit, we'll maybe bring a chair for you to sit. But I'm going to invite anybody who feels they need to take care of something to come and stand at this foot of this cross. One of the things we're going to do, if you're watching online right now, we're actually going to stop our live stream. We're going to stop our recording. Why we're going to do that is because we want to protect the people in this room. Okay? I want this room to be a safe space for you to say, listen, I got something in my life that I need to take care of. Sin is a big deal to God. Sin has ripple effects that goes throughout everywhere. It's never in isolation. And every sin will eventually be exposed. Let's expose it today. Don't be aching and sorry that it gets exposed. Be like Jesus and be grateful that it's there. And then share that. And I'm going to say it too. If you don't know anybody in this room, if there's anybody with an orange name tag, you can grab them and say, listen, I need to talk with you. I need to pray with you. Okay? So as the song is playing, you can come up and stand at the cross. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to sing this song. God, I'm trusting you right now because that's what you had said. Sin is a big deal to you, God. God, every time we make a self-centered, selfish decision, it affects all of us around. It never exists in isolation. And God, forgive us when we justify where we hit the bullseye at. When we say, yeah, I know I didn't, I didn't quite hit the, the bullseye, but man, I at least got the target. God, forgive us when we're more concerned about someone else's sin than we are our own heart. And God, right now, I'm just praying and trusting the spirit that I believe that there are people in this room right now that need to have the courage during this next song to come stand at the foot of the cross and just to say, listen, maybe there's something I'm seeing, maybe there's something I'm wanting, maybe there's something I've taken, maybe there's something that's hidden that I need to have exposed. God, that we're not sorry that we got caught, but that we're sorry for what we did. And we would be a church where it's okay not to be okay. And we're not going to be judged. We're not going to be looked down on. Because last I checked, God, every single one of us are in the same boat. We need your love. We need your forgiveness. We need your grace. And God, I know as this song is playing, the enemy is going to pop up in your mind and, and they're going to plant all kinds of the lies about, oh, I, I don't need to do that or that's no big deal. I don't, or people might think, I don't. God, I just pray for your power of your spirit through this next song that you would give people the wisdom and the courage to come forward if there's something they need to take care of at the cross. And God, for those who come forward, I pray that the rest of us would surround them with your love and grace. We would listen to them if we need to. Support them and love them. Because God, we're taking this community for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to be like Joshua where we go in and try to take AI and yet there's sin and there's problems in our own heart, God, and that causes ripple effects. So God, I'm asking that if you would expose that, if there is anything in our lives and in our church specifically, God, that we need to take care of, that you would expose it in Jesus' name right now. And we would take care of it because we're on a mission and that's to show your love and your grace to this community. Thank you and you praise and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.